Welcome to SKP's Tech Shorts of 10. First of all, I would like to introduce you to my recently published book on microservices. It is available on Amazon Prime, Flipkart India and on the website of Notion Press. Scan the QR code provided over here to take you directly to the Notion Press site. You may purchase it at a discounted price using the coupon code. It gives you great insights into decision making for microservices adoption in your enterprise. It is ideal for lead engineers, senior architects, directors, VPs and CTOs. Welcome again to SKP's Tech Shorts of 10. It's abbreviated to T-Short. These are 10-minute videos to quickly introduce and learn technical topics. It will be best to watch this during your tea or lunch breaks to get introduced to technical topics of your choice. The first in this series is the Microservices Masterclass Series. We start with quick insights and understanding of the pains of monolithic architecture. The agenda of this T-Shot is to introduce monolithic architecture before moving to the disadvantages, pitfalls and failures of monolithic architecture. Beyond this, we briefly introduce the topic and promise of microservices architecture. Let's zoom ahead. So, monolithic. I am sure that you already have an understanding of monolithic architecture. Ever since we started developing software, it was almost always and naturally using a monolithic form of architecture. One of the meanings of monolith in the English dictionary is very large, united, and difficult to change. So, in software development terms, what does it really mean? A single block of software such as desktop software and distributed architectures like 2-tier, 3-tier, n-tier are all examples of monolithic architecture. In this style of architecture, when the scalability needs of an application increase, it will require the entire application to scale. Well, this is not the problem. The real problem is that, in fact, only certain core components or functionalities of the application needs to be scaled. For the sake of this T-Shot, we will use the most common and standardized example of a three-tier monolithic architecture. Prior to the microservices world, most enterprise systems would have chosen a three-tier monolithic architecture for their implementation. Before we proceed, I need to ask you a question. Are you aware of the difference between a tier and layer? I am sure that all of you developers, architects and engineers have come across these terms right from the time you started into software development, especially if you are from the J2E or the .NET world. But most of the times, no one is aware of the subtle difference because of that thin line of usage. Till now, you might have used this interchangeably, but after you hear me out, I am sure you will be able to identify and use these terms more aptly. Tiers are physical separations of groups, of similar or dissimilar kind of layers, that run on the same physical infrastructure. Layers are logical or functional groupings while tiers are physically separated units. For example, the user interface renders on a web browser. Hence, it qualifies as a disparate physical existence with a specific logical concern, the client tier. Next, the web layer or presentation layer might exist along with a business layer, with each of them on a web server and application server, respectively. They may also be deployed together on an application server, presentation layer runs in the web container and business layer runs in the application container. Hence, this qualifies as a single, physical, grouping of deployments having different, logical, concerns, the middle tier. Similarly, the logical database schema will be on a physical database tier or eyes tier. From this introduction, you can understand that tiers are physical deployments of logical layers. Groups of layers, similar or dissimilar, that operate on the same infrastructure are also set to divide into tiers. Bef Look at this diagram carefully. It is a typical three-tier monolithic architecture that you might have across in many of your projects. It shows the separation between the physical tiers of presentation, application and database which are physically disparate deployments. Each of them might have multiple layers, which are logical components based on responsibilities or concerns. This is a typical three-tier monolithic architecture for developing enterprise software. First is the client tier. Now, the client tier is, physically, entirely on the client side. In other words, it is the user-visible user interface of the application. Typically, this is rendered by the web container as in the below diagram. The end user will interact with the application through this user interface rendered on the client tier. Moving to the middle tier. 
In the J2EE world, we can also think of this as the J2E business layer. Traditionally, this has two main layers hosted in the web container and the application container, EJB container. Additionally, a layer with the purpose of accessing data can exist, usually called as the data access layer. Moving to the database tier or ICE tier. This may also be referred to as the database server or database layer. The purpose is clear and easily deduced from the naming, it is used to store the data, for the purpose of this video, you may visualize it as RDBMS or database. The database may have various schemas, tables that store the application data. Some of the flavors of RDBMS are Oracle, MySQL, PostgreSQL, DB2. You must note some authors may call this AIS tier, Enterprise Information Services tier. Also, you must understand that data may not always reside in a RDBMS, it may exist in a NoSQL DB, other web services, data sources, streaming data sources, connected devices, unstructured data, file systems, or any other form of data that is required to be accessed, processed by an application. The database tier is usually accessed from the middle tier. Once you are able to visualize the three tier correctly and understand the needs and functions of each tier, you will be able to appreciate the fact this notion can be extended to n tiers depending on the concerns, contexts or functionalities that may exist in an enterprise application. Since now you are well equipped with the basics of tier versus layer, three tier and n tier monolithic architecture, it is time to move to the core of our discussion. Let us take a look at what are the pitfalls, disadvantages and failures of the monolithic architecture. It will be great if you can relate this back to your software development experience that you may have gained professionally, and formally or academically, even though all of it will be valid only for enterprise software development. Remember, the core topic of our discussion is the pains of monolithic architecture. So, I request you to visualize any monolithic software system and the associated environment, processes that were followed in your organization or institution, as I take you through each of the pain points. One of the most important aspects of software development is the team that is developing the software. The concerns of architecture, layer-wise or feature-wise is the usual way to organize teams of varying specialties. Most of the times, these sub-teams are on the same broad skill set or technology stack. Now, although this is correct, it does not truly really allow a team to completely concentrate on a problem or a feature, in whole. This is just because they have too many incoming or outgoing dependencies, standards or guidelines. Also, there is a chance, that, in the same organization, teams of different skills or technologies might want to come together in an organization to build the application features or components. Each of them may want to layer their individual components to their own specific needs, ecosystem. This is not easily possible with monolithic systems. In software engineering, coupling is the degree of interdependence between software modules. It is a measure of how closely connected two modules or components are. The systems built with the monolithic thought process are more tightly coupled across layers or across components, since they reside on the same server function, most of the times. Services or components are more tightly coupled. Even by using correct solid and oops paradigms, they will still be more tightly coupled because of being packaged in the same binary. Software systems sometimes have stringent non-functional requirements related to performance and scalability. These systems are usually marred by symmetric scalability, that is, system resources are shared alike between the services that do not have any special scalability requirements and ones that have stringent scalability requirements. Usually, systems need asymmetric scalability, wherein the core features or core business logic services may have higher scalability requirements and the helper services or non-core features might require lesser hardware, memory, or any other system resources. Availability of a systems needs to be thought as a different technical requirement different from others. With monolithic systems, if a server comes down, almost always, the entire application stops responding. Even if it is a highly available configuration, there are times at peak load that the entire system stops responding or slows down to the point that the application becomes unavailable. So, well, the most important outcome of engineering is that the innovation, product or product feature is made available in the market early, is flexible and is easily sellable in the market. In the case of monolithic architecture, the disadvantage is that business to engineering bridge is more complicated or may need more time to deliver upon. 
Also, the service or a product is almost always thought as a complete unit and will be sold as a subscription or fixed price or pay-as-you-go mechanism. Usually, when a customer wants only a subset of the services or only the core features, business teams would bundle it up, but under the hood the service or product may still be one large unit of code or a large deployment binary. So, this next topic is the one that usually causes the most performance, stability, scalability, availability and reliability issues in enterprise software. It is the database. You may have worked on some form of database development either directly or indirectly. When we mention database here, it simply means RDBMS. Most of the times, an architect is given the arduous task of meeting and exceeding not only in delivering the functional requirements but also on the non-functional requirements. Now, when we speak of the non-functional requirements we usually talk all of performance, scalability, stability and availability in one breath. Even though they are related, they all usually need to be handled separately. Many of the times, these issues have one is to one correlation with the database performance and scalability. If not directly with the database, they may have to do with data access layers of the application. For almost every request to an application, the database is that one critical resource that decides the performance. As the load increases, that is the number of incoming requests, the database can deteriorate in performance. Also, in effect the increased number of requests on an application reduces the performance for each request or query to a point that the application response time may become unacceptable. This is termed as the scalability of the application or the database. So, the entire effort in application architecture and design, now, is focused to make sure that application meets the performance, scalability, stability and availability needs. The point, that is being, tried to be driven across is that database is one resource which is almost always the biggest bottleneck to meet these requirements. Even with adequate functional, load, stress, or soak testing, the application may fail while in real-world production environments. With the above discussion, it is clear that database or RDBMS becomes the albatross around the software architect's neck, the single point of architectural concern that may even decide the market success or customer satisfaction index of an application, product or business. For all Now that you have understood the pains and disadvantages of the monolithic architecture, we had to find solutions to each of these issues. Rather, we needed an overall alternative that will help alleviate these issues. This marks the entry of the new superstar, microservices. Rams, we are trying to visualize the differences between the various software architectural styles, monolithic, SOA and microservices. So, what exactly are microservices? Monolith is a single unit or block of software, wherein all components, services and configuration required to run an application or application layer are bundled into a single deployment, that are mostly a set of layers deployed on a tier. Microservices are a fine-grained division of system features, components or services, each of these divisions is capable on running on its own tier and with its own layers. Very simply, it means that each of your application feature may be its own independently deployed service now. But how does it solve each of our problems? That is what we will look at next. Before we move to that last topic of discussion, let's take a brief look at another type of software architecture. In between this single unit software style and fine-grained software architectural paradigm, lies the service-oriented architecture, or the SOA style of architecture. In SOA, rather than concentrating on splitting features into individual components, we look at a higher level notion of integration of enterprise applications via a central communication bus. It can be thought of as a loosely coupled set of complete monolithic applications communicating with each other. In this newer world, a mixed or hybrid architecture may be used where monolithic and microservices may fit into an already existing SOA style. Remember, architectural styles may be mixed, and forced as per the organization's needs. Even though SOA might lessen a few issues faced by monolithic, it is only with microservices we are able to really alleviate the issues and shortcomings of both monolithic and SOA. So, microservices is the reigning number one architectural choice of most organizations. At this time, software or IT organizations are making a move to microservices architecture under the name of modernization, transformation or strategic R&D.
As we end this tea shot, I am going to very briefly take you through the promise microservices architecture brings to the world. The points that we had discussed as the disadvantage of monolithic architecture are presented here again, along with the ways and means that microservices alleviates them or solves them altogether. The first point is related to Dave teams and their independence. With the advent of microservices, there is a new promise of truly allowing development teams to focus on their development irrespective of the technology stack. This allows global teams now to better concentrate on their development. Moving to software performance. In theory, the performance of microservices should ideally be greater than a similar monolithic service since the application feature will now have its own server, database, and resources. But since microservices have many infrastructural services and the communication overhead can result in a negative outcome. With microservices can be made truly independent of each other and thereby really loosely coupled. They will be deployed on disparate servers and can now even be built with any technology that is the expertise of the company, unit. The next point is on availability. In the microservices world, the independent nature of services now allows us to better plan for high available fault tolerance, failure recovery, retry on fail mechanism are now more automated and efficient. Also, the failure of a single service will never bring the entire application down. With the advent of microservices, one of the greatest advantages is that it allows us to architect design systems that can scale independently at every level, whether it's at the database level or any resource that might otherwise have been shared. This will allow us to plan and size for systems accurately and more cost effectively. This means that asymmetric scalability can be achieved by allocating the required resources such as CPU, memory, disk among others, depending on the specific requirement of that feature or component. With microservices, mostly there is a widely agreed upon standardized architecture that is a master blueprint for organizations to follow for their microservices architecture. Even if companies were to adopt, implement only partial infrastructural component from the set standard, it will still mean that there is a uniform thought process in the way microservices are implemented. My next tea shot will cover the needs and motivations for microservices. Subsequently, there will be a tea shot each on moving from monolithic to microservices and followed by the disadvantages of using microservices architecture. The next two slides are about my professional background and my technical blog respectively. I invite you to connect with me on professional social networks. I also request you to subscribe to my technical blog that is named Tequila Shots. You will find a lot of technical articles there on Core Java, J2E, microservices, algorithms, software design and architecture. Before I end this tea shot, I will leave you with a Japanese proverb, Wabi Sabi. The English meaning of this proverb is, nothing lasts, nothing is finished, nothing is perfect. The next two slides are a